there's two sides to every coin. Then there's a conversation you can join. But I'm an old dog and there's new tricks. And some of my opinions you just can't fix. Cause I'm an old man yelling at the sky. I'ma shake my fist at the clouds and cry. Get off my lawn, you snowflake. Before I have a meltdown, breakdown, shakedown. Cause this is my hometown, so back down. Sports clown, it's all just a game. I said, I, I said it's all just a game. Say hey, uh, hello, podcasting friends, and welcome to a Friday edition of Just a Game. We are here. Um, we did not go to Nashville. Safer for everybody that way. I do not, do not wish to take anything away from the barn burner guys, uh, but my guess is they'll have a story or two for you coming up next week when they return. Uh, the National Hockey League entry draft now a Wednesday Thursday morning thing. I. I don't for the life of me get it, but all right, um, is over. Quiet, uneventful in terms of fireworks. Uh, Connor Bedard did get drafted, in, unless you were somehow thought he was going to fall through this whole thing. The Calgary Flames, the local hockey heroes, uh, made several selections, six in, in total, um, and seemed, seemed, seemed to... Fill some gaps, fill some needs, add some bigger bodies, add some skill, add a couple of blue liners. I am past the age of pretending to know the pedigree of these kids intimately. Um, obviously, uh, Sam Honzik, who they drafted in the first round from Vancouver, highly thought of. The I guess the the way you go about evaluating and. God bless uh, Ryan Pike and the kids down at the old uh, Flames Nation there. Um, <clears throat> there you go. There's where. Uh, so if you are really, really angry that the Flames didn't grab Oliver Moore, I understand why, because they could have. They could have. Uh, this is where you get into the silly season about grading drafts and things like that. Um, I, I, I've been around the NHL s so long that – it's been ingrained in me that we live in this world. They live in this world. They intersect a little bit, but what we know and what they know or what we know and what they know aren't always the same things. And to go up and refer to a draft guide to a scout or a head of scouting is always good for a laugh uh, on their part. Anyway, they have their rankings these many, many different um, groups have their rankings. Bob McKenzie has rankings. Central Scouting has rankings. This is a long way of me getting to it. It seemed like generally uh, everybody's happy that the, the Flames did not, we'll call it a Mark Jankowski, and go off the board in the first round and take some. By the way, Jankowski's still playing in the NHL, or was, or did uh, last year. Um, and man, <laughs> the way things are going in Nashville, he might, he might be their starting center. I don't know. Um, but, uh, Conroy was going to be, um, critiqued, was going to be graded, was going to be all those sort of things with his first draft. We'll see. We've got to wait three or four years. Um, uh, interesting prospects. Again, I, I, I defer you to Flames Nation and Ryan Pike and his crew. They will have be all over this stuff. Uh, just the one trade with Tyler Toffoli leaving. We are now beginning to see some buyouts. 
Um, we do have a little bit of Calgary Flames news. Uh, Jack, update us on this, but Frank is reporting that a, 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 a Maddie Phillips was offered a contract. Yeah, offered a two-year contract. Not sure if it's a one-way or two-way. Okay, but signs are that he's going to test free agency. Yeah. Okay. So the the guy that I personally have been beating the drum for would love to see the Flames come back. I think if you listen to Craig Conroy in Nashville, he would love Matt Phillips to come back. Um, local product. Uh, just I, again, I have talked to NHL scouts. There you go. He's a Group Six, by the way. I have talked to uh, NHL scouts who say he needs a chance. I've talked to NHL coaches and scouts that say nice kid, good kid, great American hockey league player, but that's all he'll be. Um, and so I respect both sides of that coin. I just really wanted to see him given an opportunity. Uh, intellectual honesty is the term that Jay Feaster coined that, that a lot of people around here still like, I don't think that we were ever intellectually honest about, um, Matt Phillips at the NHL level. I don't think he was used. I think he was used briefly. And when he was used briefly, he did not look out of place, but he was not given a long runway. And, uh, you know, th there's no point in pointing fingers and, and, you know, and running down the previous administration. Um, but w you have to develop young players. You have the way we used to develop players in the NHL. We, right. Yeah, like I did the way that, players were developed in the NHL has changed. It has dramatically changed. The requirements have dramatically changed and you need to adapt to them. And I, I, I will watch with great interest. I will be intellectually honest about it. Um, my assumption is if, if Matt Phillips goes out in the free agency market, he's looking for a one way deal to Jack's point. We we're not one way or the other. We don't know. We just know that it was a multiple year deal. Um, and I'm I'm being respectful of the player here, but for a guy who has not established himself in the NHL to walk away from a two-year one-way deal, I don't think that's what it is, but I could be proven wrong. And he's probably looking for a one-way one, one, one -way deal, um, not unlike Austin Zarnick did. And <clears throat> I am completely aware that the NHL American Hockey League tweener has been a thing for years um, there was always, always guys that ripped up the American Hockey League. And for a couple of years, they got their chances. They came up. They couldn't do it. They go back down. They rip up the American Hockey League. They come up. They go, couldn't do it. They go back. They rip up the American Hockey League and eventually go to Europe. That's a time-honored tradition. That has happened more times than we can count. But here's hoping that that changes. Um, Eric Dehatchik from The Athletic is going to join us momentarily. We have a lot to catch up with, uh, with Mr. Dehatchik. Uh, but before that, want to acknowledge a very significant um, story in the National Hockey League last, or in, pardon me, not in the National Hockey League, in the world of hockey last night. Mark, Mark Walters Group and the Billy Jean King Enterprises purchased the Premier Hockey Federation. So we now have one women's hockey entity. We've always had the two with the PWPHA. Um, they are now the ones that are, will be in control. A new league will launch in the new year. Teams, players, coaches, all of that to be named. I will say this. Um, it's a business deal. And part of the ugliness of this was last, last night they voided contracts. And they voided contracts of all the players in the PHF. Um, and we know that in the last couple of years that they've made some real significant strides in terms of finally getting good compensation, compensation where they could be full-time athletes. Um, there is a local product um, that I've been texting back and forth, and and I prefer not to get into the name part of it, but um, significant hockey player that uh, was to play in the league, and now her contract's gone. So uh, while I, I, I'm glad we're moving down this road, it's not without a little strife and not without a little controversy to sh be for sure. Um but I do remember conversations with Cassie Campbell Pascal a number of years ago. I do remember conversations with Gary Bettman not that long ago that the NHL needs to play a larger role in the women's game, but refused to do so until there was one entity. Now there's one entity. So we'll see how that goes. Um, let's bring in our guest. There's no use sitting them on the sidelines. You, when, when you've got Shohei Otani in your lineup, you make them hit. Uh, our guest is brought to you, of course, by Ski Cellar Snowboard, skisellersnowboard.com, 76 years in Calgary. Now, all four locations shut down 
for a month or so. Then they're going to fire back up in the fall, and they will have everything you need to make 2023-24 ski season the best it's ever been. Ski Seller Snowboard, skisellersnowboard.com. You know him, you love him from The Athletic, and he's our Friday analyst, Eric DeHatchett, kind enough to join us live in the Oodle Noodle studio. Um, Lots to talk about, but I will start with this. Is this one of those we thought we were going to get more than we got kind of weeks in hockey? Yes. <laughs> okay. Did, did you want me to elaborate on well, that? I just, <laughs> I just kind of felt like, this, oh, this one's different. It's different this time. And, and, and it just, we got the Toffoli deal and the, you know, we, uh, Dubois deal. And, and then it just kind of quietly went into the night in a way. Yeah. That way. Well, and I think the thing that surprised most people was that the first round of the draft was as quiet as it was. Mm. You know, there'd been a lot of talk about say Nashville wanting to move into that number five slot that Montreal had and was, were willing to part with the good young goaltender that they've got in the system of Scarf to make that, that deal happen. And then Montreal didn't take uh, the Russian Mitchkov anyway, and, and, and took the Austrian defenseman Reinbacher. And, and then there was the Carey Price snafu. So I, I think that there was, you know, a little, bit of fun to be had but mm-hmm. but in terms of of meat on the bone yeah very very little but i think that um you know the overriding theme of the lead up to the draft the draft itself the buyouts today yeah free agency starting tomorrow is there's no money in the system mm-hmm. and and what it does what that does is it changes the playing field right so let, let's say for example the calgary flames w- were listening and, and trying to make a deal for noah hannafin and 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 teams just really weren't interested in giving up much of consequence because they just felt that uh, until free agency shakes itself out until uh, until we get a, a sense of what that market is going to be like why give up meaningful tangible assets to get a player like that when potentially you might be able to find his equivalent for free and maybe even for a discount in in free agency i i, I mean i wrote a column today uh, looking at what happened last year in free agency i think people have forgotten the fact that um there really wasn't you know like usually it's stupid money and stupid term and overpays and yeah. you know dumbest day of the year other than trade deadline for you know all all that, that that's the rhetoric but yeah. last year it really wasn't you know there were three players that got seven year terms three one was Gaudreau, mm-hmm. right and that was because i think the flames le- legitimately believed up until the 11th hour and the 59th minute that he would be coming back so that's one that was suddenly available that no one expected to be another was Kadri, yep. who lingered on the market for what six weeks yep. and he was there forever yep. and the third was vincent trocheck now you know too much that was too much money for ryan strome too much money for jack campbell you know too much money for for at least six or seven other players but but not the kind of crazy spending that we saw in every year leading up to it well i think this year it's going to be more of the same and in fact to me the poster boy for last year's free agency was john Klinberg. Mm-hmm. So here's Klinberg, who turned yep. down years in term from Dallas, thinking that he could do better in free agency. And suddenly, you know, it, it's, you know, July the 31st or whatever it was. It was weeks after free agency began. He, now he's taking a one year show me deal with Anaheim and, and, and showed nothing. So now he's going back to market, coming off a terrible year. And and he's, you know, he's he's not a player that's in, in demand. So if you take a, la- a look at the at the list of free agent defensemen. If you want big and tough, you know, Mayfield's available unless he resigns in the next few hours with the, the Islanders. Uh, Ryan Graves is available. If you want a puck moving defenseman, you can get Klinberg. Mm-hmm. The way Nashville is, is operating with Johansson being traded and Duchesne being bought out, you can probably get Tyson Berry for free at this stage mm-hmm. and he can run a power play. So, so I think gridlock has set into the trade market largely because of the uncertainty over, over free agency. Nothing happens in a vacuum in the National Hockey League, Rob, you know that yep. as well as anyone. And so it's possible that, you know, free agency will play itself out. There'll be a handful of players, you know, like wondering, you know, why am I still here? Um, and, and then, you know, the, the trade talks may resume a little bit again after that. How much of an effect will the fact that the taps get turned on again next year and the year after, right? Like the expectation is that, you know, it could grow up to $10 million within three seasons, the cap within two, probably within two. Right. And we've already seen some players signing short contracts, Mm -hmm. kind of gambling on that. How much does, how much of the eye on next year is going to impact this year? 
Well, so what I would say is that, you know, I talked to a lot of the general managers in the league and 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 before I even ask a question, I, I start by saying, I hope you have a one year plan, a two year plan and then and then a plan down the road, because if you don't, then then you're not managing properly. So, yes, I think that a lot of what we're seeing today is just to get through the next 12 months, mm -hmm. because the the escrow debt uh, that the players owed the owners because of, of the lack of revenues in the pandemic will be paid off sometime in the next 12 months, probably sooner than later. So the expectation is that once that's paid off, the cap will go back to escalating in, in, the, in the, the normal yep. manner. And so most estimates that I hear, and nobody wants to talk about it on the record, even the commissioner, but but the best guesses are it, there'll be another $5 million in the system next year mm -hmm. and another $5 million after that. And so if revenues continue to, to escalate the way they have for the National Hockey League, you know, by the time you get to the summer of, of 2025, uh, there should be more money in the system. Now, you know, again, it's always just allocated to to a handful of players, usually at the top end. And, and there are always people that have to you know, take a take a haircut to, to sign just to keep jobs. But, you know, you made a reference to to the one seemingly precedent setting move, which was Vladislav Gavrikov yep. in Los Angeles signing for two years for $5.7 million, thinking that there might be a bigger payday down the road. And I, at, at right now, that looks like a very prudent thing, because I think one of the things that's going to happen uh, tomorrow is that if you're a player agent with a player that has a little is a little bit too old, or has a bit of an injury history, and somebody's got something on the table, grab it, grab it, because because you know teams teams are not going to want to go five years on on someone that missed twenty games last year, or right. or had a surgery two years ago, and is mm -hmm. turning thirty or might be thirty two. You know, in the past, those players did get paid. I don't think they're going to get paid this time around. Let's talk a little bit about the news today because I want to kind of react to your reaction, which was out of Nashville. Yeah, not, not a lot. Not a lot of things surprise you is how the tweet started. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and that that's a yeah, so I tweeted out today, you know, not very much surprises me in the National Hockey League anymore. But the fact that uh, that, you know, that Matt Duchesne, who scored 43 goals in the National Hockey League two years ago, 43. I mean, I looked it up today. So Connor McDavid had 44 two years ago and Steven Stamkos had 42. So he was a premier goal scorer in the National Hockey League a year and change ago. And and. They couldn't find a taker for him, not even at a fifty percent discount, and so they, which is what they did with uh, with Ryan Johansson a mm -hmm. week before, and so they cut him loose, and you know, and they've got like a serious cap chart. Two years from now, I think it's five point five, and three years from now, it's six point five. That's a big yep. number that Nashville is going to have to carry. Of course, you know, again, the cap will be going up then, and they have paired so many expensive players from their payroll that they'll be able to absorb that cap charge. But, but th this this is a good player. You know, this is a good player. Like Fl Flames have already said, okay, we're not going out and shopping for free agents so i'm thinking to myself okay he plays the right side mm -hmm. he'll probably play for four million on a uh, and you know and you've got jonathan huberto on the left side looking for a guy who can score goals and here's a guy who scored 43 yeah. 43 in the national hockey league last year and he's free you don't have to give up anything to get him does that change how you think about it and if the flames are rethinking it which i think they should to be honest with you um probably there's 10 12 14 other teams that are thinking matt duchene eh? because you know there are times mm -hmm. i mean he's so he's from Halliburton, ontario that's where our cottage is so you know I, I think i know him a little bit better than like there's some players that i don't, don't know at all in the national hockey league but but i i you know, I, he's inconsistent. Um, you know, there are times when when he seems like he plays on the perimeter. Uh, most people think at this stage of his career is not a center anymore. He's a right wing, but he can finish. Rob, he can yeah. finish. It's, it's a really hard skill to teach, and I think he will be motivated to play and, and prove that you know that he still has some game. I think he. He probably wants to win. Um, I think he's going to miss Nashville. I mean, one of the reasons he signed there is, he, you know, he's a, you know, he's a country music guy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he likes country music. He sings country music. He has a band of his own. His dad had a band, uh, you know, the, you know, not recently, but you used to be able to see him play at the firehouse just up the highway from where we are. <laughs> I mean, you know, so he, he's really tied into that, but guess we got country music here too. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. We got country music here. So if you're looking for a place that, that suits your interests um, and 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 your values, um, and, and a, you know, a team that that has a one of the premier playmakers in the in the game looking for a finisher. I think 
you know, I think he's somebody that that you have to look hard at. And I think there will be teams that look hard at him. And, and you know, can you get him playing, you know, more consistently and, and less on the perimeter? You know, well, that that's, you know, it, it's hard to change, you know, someone's style and approach. But but there, there have been times when he just when he can dig in. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I like him as a player and I like him as a person, too, to be honest with you. And I think that that sometimes matters. And I think what we're seeing in Nashville is is simply a complete reset. You know, the, we're, we're seeing it in Philadelphia with with Daniel Briere. Now, yep. Barry Trotz has taken over in Nashville. And I think that, you know, he's giving you know, he's giving Andrew Burnett, the, the new coach there, a, a clean slate to work with. And I think that what happened last year, if you recall, they made this big surge uh, towards the end of the season, almost made the playoffs with yep. with not a great looking roster. You yep. look down that roster and, and the people that were carrying the team were like the Tommy Novaks and the Luke Evangelistas. So I think they want to see, um, they want to provide opportunity for these players. So remember what Craig Conroy said about, you know, like not re-signing, you know, bottom end free agents. That's designed to allow players on the Wranglers who are on the cusp of breaking into the NHL to compete for those jobs. Well, I think that in Nashville's case, they have the, had those players in the NHL last year and they, they look like they look pretty good. And now they want to see how far they can go. Any of the other buyouts? I mean, obviously that one caught your attention, yeah. but any of the other buyouts surprise you? Well, no, no, surprise, no. I mean, I think we knew that it was happening with Blake Wheeler, another uh, uh, polarizing player. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's been such a part of that Winnipeg identity for a long, long time. Him, 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 and Mark Shifley, and uh, you know, a lot. He of was a thrasher, wasn't he? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah he, he came he, over. He moved, he moved over. Yeah. And, you know, he's American. And and I think a lot of people thought that he wouldn't uh, want to be there. And he signed long term. And, and you know, if you talk to Paul Maurice three, four or five years ago, that year that they got to the the conference finals against uh, Nashville, he thought that Shifley and Wheeler were were the key drivers of, of that team in terms of their leadership and uh, and and just their their play on the ice. So he's a guy that uh very difficult to deal with in the media you know mm -hmm. just doesn't have any time for reporters at all um you know has kind of a gruff attitude I, I suspect that that the way he is with us is also sometimes the way he is with with teammates i think there have been feathers ruffled in winnipeg by both him and shifley at different times uh over the years so so, you know, he's, he's, I looked it up. I think he's 36 now, but I think he turns 37 in August. So he is going to be an older player who will likely get a one-year contract somewhere uh, from a team uh, that, that has to have faith that he will be able to, uh, to take on a lesser role. So not the same player at all. Um, but, you know, when you think about, um, about what Corey Perry has been, been doing since Anaheim bought him out i mean he's moved from yep. team to team to team and he's made an impact everywhere he's gone he's yep. not the player that he once was but he can still be on that second power play unit he still gets in the face of the goaltenders he still creates trouble and havoc for for defensemen in front of the net he competes so hard you know he's such a popular guy i, I just think I mean, he's a guy that I absolutely would love to have on my team. And when you think about it, think about what, I mean, that's an overpay by Chicago, right? So Chicago has money to spend and they do need to get to the cap floor, but they overpaid for Corey Perry simply because they have Connor Bedard and they want to create um, a little bit of, uh, of protection around him. And they just feel that, you know, that the, the lessons of Perry's professionalism uh, and then just the fact that, you know, the, the way he plays on the ice will be good uh, on, on that Chicago team. So, so uh, Wheeler didn't surprise me, but, but what I am interested in seeing is, is where he might land at what price and what team feels that, uh, you know, that he might be able to just slide in and, and be a, a supporting piece where he's been, you know, the main guy for a long period of time. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. Mm -hmm. Not many people can make the transition as successfully as Corey Perry did. Most players chafe at it and, and fall out of the league really, really quickly. Uh, Jack just put up the uh, list and another guy's Detroit buying out Yamamoto. I, I'm still trying to get caught back up after being disconnected. I always thought that this was a guy that Edmonton liked and, and really had high hopes for. Is he uh, is he an injury guy? Is this the injury bug chasing him? Because he's, he's I think it's the size bug chasing him. It as is much eh? as anything. absolutely okay. yeah. Well, because I think in, in order to play the game in the National Hockey League at, at that size, you need to you need to be special. You need to be Johnny Gaudreau, you know, or yep. or Alex DeBrincat, you know, players like that that can create space for themselves and and just and, and just you know back off defenders because of their their puck handling skills. And and I think there there was a thought that that he could be that player in the National Hockey League. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't draft somebody as high as he. I think he was 22nd overall 
to, uh, you know, if you don't think that he has that skill set, because obviously the size is, is going to be an issue, even in a game where, you know, you don't have to be 6'6 six, six anymore yep. to, to play. Although we can get, because uh, I, I do think the pendulum is swinging back towards that. So I think that was part of what would influence this. You know, people watch the way Vegas played, people watch the way Florida played. Um, it just felt, you know, like the big people were squishing the little people. So, but I just think that he ha has had an opportunity at even strength in a top six role in Edmonton and didn't take advantage of it. So different than Jesse Pugliarvi because, yep. you know, Pugliarvi is a, a different type of a player, but both of those guys were given opportunities and, and the chemistry was found lacking. And so um, what do you do with 3.1 million of Yamamoto when you need to sign Evan Bouchard to a contract when you need to, they like Ryan McLeod a lot. They mm -hmm. think that uh, I, that I, I was talking to Kenny Holland about this two days ago, three days ago, I guess it was Tuesday. You know, he thinks that McLeod is, is a third line center in the national hockey league. And he thinks that he's an important piece of that, that puzzle. Um, you know, Bouchard went in there, replaced uh, Tyson Berry, became an effective player on the, uh, you know, quarterback of the power play, needs a new contract coming out of entry level is going to be expensive that, you know, they're going to bridge him, you know, yeah. that, and, uh, and then that'll get him to that point you're talking about where the summer of 2025, there might be more money to pay him, you know, what is, what his value is, but 3.1 million for, a, you know, for a small player that hadn't broken out in the time that you've had him, that was a luxury that they just didn't feel they could afford anymore. The fact that, the fact that Detroit took him on for future considerations, which is here, take him for free. Uh, and Clem Costin was in the deal makes me think that they, they feel that Costin has some value mm -hmm. and they took Yamamoto just to, you know, so that Edmonton didn't have to buy him out because Edmonton was going to buy him out if they weren't able to find a place to place him. You mentioned Jesse Pugliarvi. Uh, my understanding is will not be qualified by Carolina, but injured. Yeah. Pa Patrick Kane injured. Yeah. W what do we do? When we talked about Patrick Kane. What do you, does anybody take a flyer on a Pugliarvi? Do you wait till he's healthy? What do you do with that? So in Pugliarvi's case, I don't really know. I suspect that he's not going to get an offer right away mm -hmm. and, uh, and he will have to wait and see where, where things, uh, uh, play out. I, I think in the in the case of, of Patrick Kane, I think that he's he you know he, he's not actively being shopped right now. Right. I think he wants to see how he feels. You know, once time passes after the surgery. I mean, you have until December one to to sign guys, and uh, and then I think that that will give him a clear idea of how he feels, whether he can contribute this year. Um, you know, the longer you go into the season, the more money there will be in play. Mm -hmm. And um, and so if you sign a prorated contract on November the 30th with Carolina, say, you know, a team that could really use yep. a finisher, um, you know, then and, and then you go in there and you, you, you it either works or it doesn't work. And then, you know, maybe you you, you find a, a longer term home there uh, after that. Um, you know, do you do you think that Buffalo would take a chance on Patrick Kane? That's his hometown, right? I mean, that it would be a very interesting thing. They've got lots of offensive talent there, lots of really good young players. Um, but Kane is he's special, and, mm -hmm. and when he's healthy, I I mean, I I thought he was he you know he was okay this year at, without being anywhere close to being at full health. Yeah, um, he strikes me as a guy that's going to be a, a real good player uh you know for longer than you know like mm -hmm. some some guys not unlike the, perry the, yeah the, right the, well yeah different type same, of player yeah, same, different but, player but but i i just think you know the, the way he yeah. the way again the way he creates space mm -hmm. um he he's he's just a crafty creative player that i think can really help teams plus i mean he has a winning pedigree i mean he's won yeah. three stanley cup championships that that just Flat out matters, Rob. It, it does. Just flat out matters. Absolutely so, does. So I don't, I don't see him signing anytime soon. But I do think that that someone will take a chance on him. And in Puljujarvi's Yarvi's case, I don't know. It, it will be interesting. You know, it, does he have to go back to Finland yet again to, and 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 try to, you know, get some games under his belt and and just just show that that he can play? I mean, it, next year could easily be a lost year for 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 Puljujarvi. Yarvi, and then you know, he, he'll be at a career crossroads and we'll see. People keep talking about Nichushkin as, as the pull you Yarvi com comparable, right? So a guy that went and came back, went and came back. And then all of a sudden, you know, became a player and it was like, wow, now we see why Dallas took, you know, Nichushkin, you know, 10th overall that yeah. one year. And, and, you know, pull you Yarvi has that draft pedigree, which is the one thing like he wouldn't even be, ha we wouldn't be having this conversation if he wasn't such a high draft choice. If he wasn't taken two places ahead of Matthew Kachuk, yeah. you know, through what three or four ahead of uh, Mikhail Sergachev. I mean, 
Yikes. Can you imagine oh. if they'd gotten that one right? <laughs> I don't know why, but I look at him and I go, that's where we miss the old IHL. He just strikes me as the player that would go down to the old independent, <laughs> you know, pro league, get yeah. the big contract yeah. and work his way back up. Right. But that's not a, well, I guess you can go over to Europe. Um, okay. So buyouts, you know, non-qualified, but we're still sitting on some potential trades here. Um, or, you know, Calgary, Hannafin, uh, Winnipeg, you got to think Hellebuck and, yeah. and you know, others. You've talked about it. There's not a lot of money in the system. Are we going to see a handful of these players start the season with their club teams? And, Possibly. And, and go to the trade deadline? Yeah. Well, so uh, there's there's a couple of separate markets there. But uh, mm-hmm. if you, do sure. you want to do, do the goaltending Let's one Let's do first? the goaltending one first. Okay. Yeah. So the goaltending is really interesting because, you know, if you look around um, – the available goaltenders, tons of them, right? When you think about who who is unrestricted, so goalies that you can get for free, you know, both of the the the, the two goaltenders in Carolina, you know, Freddie Anderson and Antti Ranta, UFAs. You know, they've got a young Russian coming that's signed to a you know a, a new four year contract at really good money for them. They they want him on the roster. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of smoke screen right now. Oh, we'll bring both our guys back and we'll put Kachetkov in the minors for another year. I don't think that's happening. He's okay. he's to me he's an NHL goaltender next year. So one or one of those two guys likely will stay in Carolina, but not necessarily. You know, Carolina does bargain hunting better than anybody else in the National mm-hmm. Hockey League and is completely willing to move on from from anybody but those two are available Justin Jerry is available I think Aiden Hill is going to sign with uh, with Vegas but that means Laurent Brassois is, is available Jonathan Quick wants to play again and and he feels that he can be a a, 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 a good backup goaltender somewhere so there, there's an awful lot of moving pieces and they're the trade pieces so Hellebuck is at the top of the list but you know the word is that you know and I believe it that you know he's hoping to sign an extension in that nine million dollar range I don't. I just don't think that anybody wants to do that. You know, the two teams that that could and, and potentially should would be New Jersey and Buffalo because yeah. they they still uh, have a little bit of flexibility to to add someone. Although the, you know, New Jersey's spending its money pretty darn fast, yep. so so they're going to run out pretty soon. Um, then the the more intriguing guy to me is John Gibson in Anaheim. So I see Anaheim a lot. He's got four years left at that six four, I think, and uh, a lot of people think, okay, he, he's not the goaltender that he once was. His numbers are terrible. Well, I watch him every night, and I think he's still an elite goaltender that played on the the most defensively dysfunctional team I've seen in a long time. Yep. I mean, they played like a like an '80s team played. You know, I mean, they went to the attack, no one <laughs> back checked. Uh, the d- defense didn't clear out in front of the net. Gibson's there, save, rebound, save, rebound, save, rebound. Fourth one is in, and then he looks to the heavens and wonders, what am I doing here? So um, I think that he has, uh, you know, he has some uh, no trade protection. Uh, my uh, my feeling is that the team is probably going to try to get him to uh, widen the number of, of possible destinations. If I'm, if again, if I'm the general manager of in Buffalo or if I'm the general manager in New Jersey, I am very interested in John Gibson because I have him controlled at a number that I can live with you know, in the sixes rather mm-hmm. than the nines Absolutely. for four years. And and I have the faith in him that he is going to come in and, and be a difference maker. So so I think that there's a couple of teams that are looking for that. And then, you know, Los Angeles, I mean, because of the money they committed to Dubois for one year anyway, they need a low-cost goaltending option. But if I'm a free agent goaltender and I look at the way that team plays defense, I look at the system that they play under, under Todd McClellan, they're going to make me look good. And if the understanding is that if I go in there and get the job done, there's more money in it for me at the end of uh, yep. the rainbow, then, then that's, you know, that's, that's a job I, uh, I like. I always liken it to a game of musical chairs, right? You mm-hmm. know, and, and some of those chairs are kind of rickety and, you know, you sit on them and all of a sudden the bottom drops out. Well, I think the chair that represents the Los Angeles Kings, that, like that's one of those beautiful, lazy boys that you can, you know, <laughs> that's the chair I want to sit in if I I'm a goaltender right. looking for a new place to play this year. And, and if I have to do it as a discount to, to prove myself, uh, I do do that. So, um, I mean, I think they'd be interested in Vladar. Um, you know, I think that they, you know, sort of inquired after Mackenzie Blackwood and and just decided to go in a different direction. But there will be options. And and in, in terms of, of just every goaltender that's available, 
available, you know, right down to like the James Reimers. And I, I mean, there's just, there aren't going to be enough jobs for the number of available mm-hmm. goaltenders. There's going to be goaltenders on August the 31st that, that have played in the National Hockey League, have a decent resume and simply don't have jobs. And again, if you're running Los Angeles and you're pretty much out of money, you just have to wait for the market to clear and then see who's Excuse there. Me. Unless someone comes to you and says, I am prepared to take X dollars for one year because I think you know there's a great fit between say Freddie Anderson and and the Kings and uh, money isn't the most important thing opportunity is and if there is someone like that Tristan Jari might be that that guy then 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 you can jump on it early yeah and if not then you know then you wait to see what you know Calgary's asking for Vladar on September the 1st if he hasn't been traded yeah yeah, yeah. um defenseman obviously Hannafin's a lot of eyes on but I, I'd also be very curious about what you heard and what people were saying about Mike Greer his comments on Eric Carlson and you know Carlson's comments about you know wanting to go to yeah. somewhere to win right yeah, yeah. well again uh, you know why wh- wh- it was so hard to move at the trade deadline because there was one team that that made it you know an inquiry and it was Edmonton you know and then Edmonton went in a different direction with with Ekholm and um you know took a chance that that Bouchard could come in and and be that guy in the power play and he was so if you do want to upgrade the right side I mean how do, how do you fit how do you fit Carlson in you know they're, they're having a hard time you yep. know signing the guys that they, that they need to sign and um so if if not him, you know, the link to to Toronto. Well, you know, Toronto's got their own problems. You know, they <laughs> got to try and sign Matthews and and you know and, and what's Nylander asking for and how much are they willing to to, to pay him? Uh, it, it's just you know you think back about to, what was that famous quote from Roberto Luango? Luango, you know what? You know why are you still here? My contract sucks. You know, yeah. well you're still getting a lot of money, yes, but the structure of it um, and and the you know the the, the current you know, just a gridlock of, of the salary cap makes it very, very difficult to, to move him. So he wants out. Um, the Sharks want value for him and they're prepared to, you know, absorb a certain amount of, of money, but, but not 50%. Yeah. And so how, how do you, how do you move him? You know, I, I mean, I, I, again, I, I think that's a, that's a really difficult thing for any general manager to, to accomplish. And, and, you know, when you're new and just learning the ropes, uh, I, I think you tend to be a bit more conservative and, and say, no, I, you know, I mean, I think that that's what Craig Conroy's message to the national hockey league is. I think there's a lot of teams that are hoping that these young general managers panic yep. and the best advice that their senior advisors are going to, are giving them is don't panic, don't show weakness and just, you know, stick it out. If, if you have to, if you have to, look, let's use Calgary as an example. Yep. If you have to start the season with Noah Hannafin in the lineup with Elias Lindholm in the lineup, knowing that the clock is ticking, then rather than trade them for 70 cents on the dollar, uh, wait to see how, how things go. Because the one thing that, that didn't really change last year or the year before or the year before that is how, how crazy, uh, expensive players were at the trade deadline. I mean, that mm-hmm. was one of my, my, my thoughts with, with even, even with what the flames got for, for Toffoli. I understand, you know, that they targeted that young Russian Char- Sharon Govich as a player that they, they like to have, and they wanted in, in, in their lineup at the, at the start of the season, but, but potentially you could have done as well or better uh, by waiting at the, the trade deadline. Yep. Now, you know, of course, the the challenge then becomes: uh, what do you get off to a great start? You know, and, and what if Lindholm is back scoring the way he's scoring mm-hmm. because he's motivated, and and Hannafin is playing great? And will can you take a player off of your team uh, while you're you know in a playoff run? Um, which and that's really challenging to do. Now Doug Armstrong does it. Yeah, you know, he's he and he's done it in the past. Yeah. and uh, and you know it's worked out. You know, they've managed to make the playoffs even when they take players off. But it, but it gets harder and harder, and then. You potentially paint yourself in the same corner as as you did with uh, with Gaudreau, but uh, but again, it's um, it, it's kind of the, the you know a, a big giant game of chicken right now. You know that uh, you know teams are I think making lukewarm offers at the moment because they don't know how free agency is going to unfold, and so you know unless you really love Noah Hannafin and are willing to overpay, which clearly nobody was at the mm-hmm. in the lead up to the draft, then. Maybe you have to wait. It's the Carlson one that really intrigues me because I can't even invent a scenario in which I can move that contract, you know, based on what Mike Greer said. Now, Greer's obviously trying to set the market too, but, but, you know, you mentioned Toronto, like 
you know, where, how, how. Yeah, where, yeah, how, I mean, yeah, exactly. you know, and to me, Jack and I were talking about it a week ago and I said, well, how about Florida? Yeah. They move out some pieces. They could, bring, yeah. you can't even invent this scenario right now. No, no, to move that contract. No, I, I can't either. And, and I invent trades all the time. I mean, <laughs> one of the most popular things we do is, is create hypotheticals at sure. the athletic, you know, how about this guy for that guy? And you always want there to be some logic there. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, truthfully, you know, some whiff of that's actually might be happening kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but in this particular case, yeah, I'm stymied, you know, like, you know, come up with seven uh, trade destinations for, for Carlson and, and I'll knock each one of them down. Now, you know, at yep. some point I do expect, Expect that he's going to be traded. I mean, the best one that I could come up with was was to Edmonton for Jack Campbell's contract. You know, which I don't think is going to happen now because they took on Mackenzie Blackwood. But so you're Edmonton and you've got four more years of Jack Campbell at you know five million. So you know, publicly, what you know when you're asked about Campbell, you're probably saying, okay, you know, he didn't have a great first year. That has happened in the past to mm-hmm. to players coming in as free agents. They overthink it. They're trying to earn every dollar. Mm-hmm. He'll be better in year two, and that mm-hmm. has happened. You know, mm-hmm. Jacob sure Markstrom was better in year two than, than he was in in year one. So yeah. you can say that publicly, but but deep down, you probably think that Stuart Skinner. Is, is your goaltender and if he's is your goaltender and you think you can get two-thirds of the games out of him any number of those you know cheap you know laurent brossois you yep. know paired with uh, stewart skin you'd probably be pretty happy with that and you can get brossois for a fraction of that so if they take five million of jack campbell off of your payroll and then eat four million of eric carlson to make him a seven million dollar player <laughs> Wow. Now we're two million apart. Wow. You know, so that they get Cody Cece in the deal, or wow. or you know what? Yeah, the, no. no, no, they get Philip Broberg in the deal. That's okay. who they get. They get Philip Broberg okay. in the deal. So now they've got a young piece that makes it worth their while. Maybe you, you give them a first round pick. I don't know. I, I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I, I but that that's the only one. And and again, there was a hint of interest in Edmonton sure. in Carlson just you know, just because you know like he is it was really his five on five numbers that were so impressive right and so if you have you know Connor McDavid going out there or or Leon Dreisaitl going out there and then you've got Carlson you know getting the puck up on the play uh you know it's not that they didn't score enough goals last year but really their five on five scoring wasn't that great like if mm-hmm. you if you break you know t- yeah. take that unbelievable power play out of the mix it's true they could use some help five on five and carlson was excellent driving play five on five last year so again if we're if we're creating scenarios that's the only one that i can create and i don't think it's going to happen but but you know that that's the best i can do no I, <laughs> but that's i that's where i'm stymied too and and i i don't know if i'm being fair to Tarek carlson or not but it, it seems to me there's two seasons in the nhl he would really help you in the regular season mm-hmm. But if you're playing in Vegas in game, you know, game six of the Western Conference Final, and you're up by a goal, is he going over the boards? Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe not. You know, but but if you're down by a goal, he sure. Yes. Is. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah for sure. Okay, so for sure. Know, yeah. So now we're talking about coaching, right? But I, I, I mean, you know, the, the, no, I just all, don't think he's a very good defensive. No, of course not. Yeah, right? yeah. Although you know, if he has the puck all the time, yeah, that is a form enough. of of defending. But no, no, yeah. you, you you make a point. But but again, I you know I I think that you know more and more. I mean. You know, I think we watch the game pretty closely, mm-hmm. right? Just you, you watch utilization, right? There are certain players that play in, in some situations and not in others, right? You know, who's going to be the guy that you want to take the defensive zone face off, you know, when you're holding a lead? Uh, it's it's different than the guy that's going to take it if you're trying to get one goal back, right? And that, you know, that's basic bench coaching. And I think just about everybody, the coaches in the NHL can figure that out and and and, and knows how to protect players. Now, that's the other thing that, that people don't really probably want to talk about too much that that all players have flaws on, oh, on sure. some levels right sure. so so the best coaches are the ones that take a guy that has a hole in his game and and gets the maximum value out of of the things that he does well and then as a coach you know tries to help cover for his yeah. weaknesses by not putting him in situations where he gets exposed and and that's why bench coaching is so important and i think that um you know, maybe we don't write about it enough or talk about it enough, uh, but you can, you know, you can poke holes in every player's game. But if a guy's played in the National Hockey League for X number of years and he's had a 30 goal season and a 40 goal season, you know, he's going to help you somewhere. Yeah. Um, want to shift gears just a little bit because I don't I, I need you to tell me if I'm close or if I'm way off on this. We're talking about Noah Hannafin and uh, Toffoli, all of these players and the same thing in Winnipeg, these players that are 
still under contract for a year, yeah. but now have become going concerns a year before that. Right. Yeah. It's a little bit in this city, obviously driven by Johnny and, and Matthew Kachuk last year. How, how do general managers around the league look at this? And I'm framing it from, we can blame Doug McLean in Columbus for the second lockout in 2012 because of the second contract for Rick Nash, right? right? Yeah. And they eventually got to a point where they said, we've got to put a stop to that. Mm -hmm. Is are, are the hockey brains getting upset with this? Is this something that could become an issue in negotiations down the line? That the sense that now we're dealing with these things even further out. So are you talking about CBA negotiations? I'm talking about CBA negotiations. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say no. Okay. No, I would say okay. no. I, I think that one of the things I, I you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm saying that uh, the national, the NHL Players Association has new leadership right now, mm -hmm. and so it's very difficult to tell what is going to be important to Marty Walsh, who right. you know, as he gets comfortable in in the job, and and he's still at that that the stage right now where he's gathering information, you know. Uh, every head of the nhl players association does you know tours of, of teams and, mm -hmm. and meetings in the dressing room and and you know submit sure. your questions and you know i'm not sure if that you know if they do it with you know powerpoint now or if <laughs> <laughs> or if it's the old-fashioned way where they just you know pace back and forth and, and and speak but uh but no i i think that you know part of you know what what's been happening lately is it uh, you know a, a lot of of uh the CBA stuff it was extended during the pandemic. Uh, the idea was we really, after years of pretending to work together, but not really working together, we have to work together now to, mm -hmm. to get us out of that hole. Because let's face it, you know, the, you know, when, when people weren't paying to watch NHL hockey for that length of time, that, uh, you know, that made it, a, 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 they took a business model that was working and made it, you know, dysfunctional for a while. And now it's back to working again. So, yep. so he needs to sort out what's important for the players and uh, and then those will become the key platforms in whatever negotiating strategy they have going forward. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, players have won their rights just very, very slowly and, and incrementally. Yep. Um, and and I, I think that as long as there, you know, there is a hard cap system, um, the, the league is not going to get any more concessions in terms of you know, of clawing back the age of free agency and and, and things like that. So I think that okay. uh, I think they just understand that uh, that this system, um, you know, uh, favors the owners more so than mm -hmm. than the various CBAs that we see in basketball, Major League Baseball, and uh, and 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 professional football in the states. So um, so yeah, I I don't see it becoming a CBA issue. Okay. I, I just think that it's uh, it you know I mean I've posed this question to Craig Conroy at, to Dave Nonis at the press conference that you know you have to make this a destination. You, you have to make oh, it a yes. destination, yes. right? So yeah. so a new building is going to make it a destination. Um, I mean. You know, I, I said this in a in a note to a reader the other day. You know, I subscribed to to the Economist, and a week or ten days ago, they published the index of the best cities in the world to live. And Calgary's tied for seventh with Geneva, Vancouver's six, I think, and Toronto was nine or ten. It's a great place to live. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I don't have to convince you. You don't have to convince me. No. Uh, so, but but you do have to convince players that this is a place that you want to be. And I do think that, you know, that Craig Conroy is, is great at that because he's exhibit A. You yeah. know, he's an American that came up here, wasn't, you know, keen about being traded here, found it to his liking, came back a second time, uh, you know, has settled here, raised his family here. Um, if you, if the things that, you know, that, you know, I value like skiing, right? You know, yep. I came out here to ski and then yep. stayed for 45 years. Um, hiking, uh, you know, great golf courses. I played Kananaskis twice already this year. You know, I mean, it's this is an unbelievable place to live. So that has to be communicated to to the players. And and then beyond that, so that makes your wife happy and your, mm -hmm. your children and your family happy if, if, if they just like the place. Then winning really helps because, you know, Edmonton isn't exactly a destination, but it's more of a destination because guess what? Connor McDavid is there. Absolutely. And, and, and Leon Dreisaitl is there. So yep. now you get to play with the greatest players in, in the world. So yep. all those things matter. 
But if you can put together a, a program, well, think about, you know, when Harley Hotchkiss and, and Doc Seaman were the voices of, of, of the franchise and, and all the players that, that came through here. You know, every time I speak to, about, to Joe Newendike, he, he brings up Harley's name. It mattered, right? Yeah. So, uh, so you have to recreate the feeling that was here before. I think you can do it. You know, the city's easy to sell. New building's going to make it... Uh, um, you know, more palatable to to the players that that care about the, you know amenities and you know and wives' who, who rooms. Does, and things like who that. does it? Who does it well? I like. I I think it's the team that we just talked about, Matt Duchesne leaving. I I you know I my first ever trip was October twenty third of two thousand eight. Went in there and saw the Flames and the Predators. There might have been nine thousand fans in the building, yeah. and that was if you'll remember that was when guys like me, why is he putting teams in the Sun Belt? This is stupid. Hockey will never work there. Yeah. It's not a hot. It's it's destination for hockey now. Yeah. There's I know parents who are taking kids to tournaments. Our superheroes kids are likely going to a tournament there in a couple of years because yeah. they have a big special hockey tournament. It's a it's a hockey. Mecca now, in a way, Mecca might be a big word, but yeah. but boy, everybody looked like they had fun at the draft and wanted to be there. Well, and, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you need to get the Canadian equivalent of Tootsies going here. <laughs> we have cowboys. Well, Doesn't that work? That's pretty close. Yeah, yeah. I'd say. In fact, actually, it's way better than Tootsies. <laughs> yeah, which, which yeah. truth to be told, is a dump. It's <laughs> the size of a Seven <laughs> Eleven. It's a dump. <laughs> I know. Oh, do, do people in Nashville listen to us? Well, no. so, okay. So I, I'm leaving uh, the draft and the page one, and I bought the Tennessee and at the airport, and the page one story is about the, the gentleman just retiring from the, from the convention bureau that has spearheaded all of the, um, the events that have come to Nashville. And they're okay. talking about uh, the, the primary focus seemed to be an NFL draft. Apparently they got the draft. I, I don't know my NFL history is nearly as well as my hockey, but they got the NFL draft a year after Dallas had it. And Dallas is, you know, the Cowboys and Jerry Jones and cheerleaders and everything else. And, and uh, the feeling was that Nashville is not, in any way capable of putting on a similar show and of course they did and it was a big giant party and everybody loved it but yep. you know i mean i uh when i flew down on on sunday so we had you know flames were all on the plane but Connor bedard was on the plane the woman sitting next to me was a country western singer you know and had, had her guitar in the overhead bin so uh, it, it 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 it's attractive on a for a lot of different reasons but yeah. but they've convinced people that you can go to national and have a good time and you know I think we know that you can come to Calgary and have a pretty good time too. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, that's almost, you know, that's kind of chamber of commerce sort of, sort of stuff, right. That, uh, that you need to be able to do. And well, and, doesn't, but doesn't the team, and, and again, this is not me laying all of this at the feet of Murray Edwards or John Bean, but doesn't, you know, how much of a role did the predators and the Titans play in, you know, and they were partners in that, right? They're the ones that brought the events. They're the ones that, you know, made it cool. Like it was really kind of the first place, Eric, that I went to. And I think LA Live, but it was like LA but Live. Like you came out and there was something to do, yeah. right? Like yeah. you weren't done. Your evening wasn't done yeah. when you came out of the rink. No, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's what they tried to do in, in, in Phoenix, right? You know, yeah, they did. out in Glendale. And, yeah, and it they didn't did. work. Well, my, my sister, uh, who, who studies everything but hockey, said that that the the television show Nashville changed everything. So there was a television show Nashville, okay. and it became uh, it, it became popular with a certain type of, of viewer, mostly female, I understand. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, female bachelor parties started going to Nashville, and it, be, it it just became a thing. And and so maybe what you need to do is is create a television program called Calgary, and show everyone what a fun time can be had here. And then all of a sudden, you know, people will will start flocking to to this city. But I also think climate has something to do with it, right? I mean, you know, we, oh for sure, what, when people come here in the summer for the Stampede, uh, but there's no hockey being played at that time, and and it does occasionally get cold here in the it winter. does yeah, it yeah. does and so. we've got you covered ski seller ski yeah. seller snowboard <laughs> <laughs> anyway no, yeah, but, I, I just, but no you're right i i, I mean I, I think that uh but part of it is it, it's just the, the the reputation i mean you know nashville's music city and and uh yes but i i also and i'm positive that uh, you and I had these conversations, you know, they hired Mike Keenan. What does Mike Keenan say? Oh, it's such an honor to be in a Canadian market. And, you know, it's, it, there's only six of them or at the time or whatever, you know, even Brent Sutter. Oh, it's an honor to coach in a Canadian market. And and it got said so often that I just didn't believe it anymore. And now I don't believe it at all. No, no. It, not the coaching part, but 
you know, the Canadian market doesn't hold that same gravitas. Well, part of the problem is that, you know, when, when you, when I was asking the question about, you know, the number of, of no trade clauses to teams in Canada. And so, you know, like the Calgary, Winnipeg, Ottawa are on every no trade mm -hmm. clause and, and, but, but Toronto, you know, uh, uh, Edmonton and, and Vancouver are on, a, are on a bunch too, Montreal. And so, um, and, and when I was talking to an agent, of course, didn't want to be quoted about it. It says, <laughs> and it isn't just the Americans. There's a lot of Canadians that don't want to play in Canada. And, you know, I don't know how you get around no, that. I, I mean, the, part, part of it is that, you know, the, the feeling is that, that you're under so much of a microscope here and not just yourself, but your family too, you know, so kids are in school, teams on a losing streak, kids hear about it, you know, they come home. You know, so and so. You know, dad's daddy's in a slump, and and it's like you know when it when it spills over into family life, then mm -hmm. players take that personally. And and if you go and play, you know, virtually two thirds of the of the teams in the United States, you your job is to go to the rink on a practice day and and play it, you know, and have a morning skate and and, and a game on on game days. And most of the rest of the time, you're you're on your own. People don't recognize who you are. And it is it is interesting, Rob, because even when you're you you're, you're so I'm wandering around Nashville for for three days. It doesn't matter who you are. You put a ball cap on somebody, and, and they don't look like a player. Well, that's the, Davidson, the Kyle the, Davidson. Yeah, I was going to say that was right? going to be that was going to be the point yeah. that I make. So, so you you know you throw on a t-shirt, put a baseball cap on backwards, and, and nobody knows who you are, right? So it it does really, um, it is different. It is different, and you know. And when I asked Craig Conroy that uh, for a story about a week ago, he said, "But you know, but people here are respectful. You know, they'll come up after dinner and you know ask for you know a, an autograph, maybe or, or a photo. But they they leave, mm -hmm. they let you have your privacy. But um, but it is it's still not the same as it is in, in in a place where you can, if you want to, just you know disappear into into the woodwork and just show up and do your job, and the rest of the time it is your own. So privacy, I think, does matter." In the world of professional athletes, yeah. and um, and and I I'm pretty sure that that's not anything you're going to be able to get around in uh, in a Canadian market. You just need to attract the type of player that doesn't mind the spotlight that 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 just wants to wants to be here. You know, the the, the best thing that Craig Conroy said to me when we were talking about it, he said, "I played in LA, you know, and yeah, it's great to go to Dodger Stadium and it's great to do all those things." He says, "But we play hockey, we play hockey." And, you know, hockey's a winter sport, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, it'd be different if it was a, a summer sport, but, but this is, this is a, a winter climate and you're being paid professionally to play a winter sport on ice. Right. So do you know uh, what I think the difference there is Okay. And this one may, you may not agree, but he, he being Craig comes from that, you know, that 96 world cup, less of the, you know, that group was the inspirational group for a lot of, you know, Craig would have been kind of a teenager when that happens and everything. And at that point, hockey just wasn't the same down there, right? It hadn't caught on that 96 team really kind of sparks it. Mm -hmm. I think when Craig came to Calgary, this was a revelation. It was 24 seven hockey. He could watch mm -hmm. hockey whenever he wanted. He consumed it. He's a fan. He's that. I, I just don't think these players come aren't fans of the game the way mm -hmm. the Craig Conroy's and the Lanny McDonald's were that, you know, you grew up and you want to be in the NHL. Now you grow up and you got a sports psychologist and a nutritionist and somebody's making excuses for why it didn't work for you. I just, I don't know if the young player has the same passion for the sport that they used to, if that makes any sense. It does. Yeah, no, I think you're completely right. And I, I think about the interview that Danielle Briere did on the second day of the draft where he, where he made that point. He was talking more about the difference between scouting on video and seeing a player live mm -hmm. and he said that there's that there's value there's greater value to seeing a player live because you can you can see more you can see the interaction with teammates you can see the passion he said you know like he said I, to, to, to you know, Briere's point was that that the players that we want to, to recruit are the ones that that have that burning passion in inside that want to be flyers that want to be yeah. hockey players that care about it it's not just you know collecting a paycheck it's not a dream to get to the national hockey league i i, I do think that i i see a percentage of young players who like everything about being an nhl player except playing the games yep. you know so they like yep. the the clothes and they're like walking into the arenas and, yep. and they like smiling for the fans yep. and and then you get out on the ice and it's a body contact sport and there are a lot of big 
strong, tough guys. And if the puck is on your stick, they're they're going to do what they can to, to take it off your stick. And they just don't like that part of it. Yeah. So, you know, money's great. You know, the you know the lifestyle is great. Uh, the notoriety and Instagram photos that you can post are great. Um, but what it takes to be a successful player. They sometimes don't like that. So uh, I, I think basically when you when you draft, you try to recruit players that 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 you identify as having that mm -hmm. that fire that you're talking about. Yep. No, I, I mean, I don't disagree with you at all. You're 100 percent right. That's and that's an issue. And, and that's why it's more complicated operating here, more complicated operating in Winnipeg, Ottawa. To me, those are the three hardest. Edmonton will eventually join that ranks once they're past the McDavid dry cycle, but they have a special exemption in the same way they did when when it was Gretzky and Messier. You know, yes. It was it was just a you yes. know, you know, they got Kent Nelson to play hard. You know, yeah. I mean it was, you know, or harder, yeah. you know, than they ever played in Calgary or or Minnesota, more focused. And it was just a function of of having, you know, Messier there to you know, to uh, get him, get his attention. I'm a little worried about Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. I am a little bit worried about sure. Winnipeg. You know, they had the honeymoon. They've got the smaller rink. They don't quite have the same revenues. Now the players, not revolting. They're not revolting, but they're moving on. They're going to that next. Mm -hmm. And I know even locally in their media, they've been talking quite a bit. I'm a little bit worried about Winnipeg. Yeah, you should be. I, and I think that it's real. I mean, one of the things that I'm thinking is that if you're trading off all of these players, you need, you need to acquire players that are under team control for a while, you know, that don't have no trade clauses, you know, and then, then once you get them there, you need to sell them on, on the virtues of it. You know, I saw a fan tweeted out, to, you know, have those players come up in the summer and buy a cabin out in, in mm -hmm. Falcon Lake and, and show, show them what a great place it is because, you know, most of them come in and if, if they're there a couple of nights twice a year, and it happens to be one of those minus 30 sure. days yep. and the wind is howling, yep. um, you know, you can, you can get a, 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 a skewed view of it. You know, I think about, you know, Josh Morrissey, a Calgary kid mm -hmm. who's there and signed a long-term contract, likes it, you yep. know, likes, a, yep. you know, a lot of the things that are, you, you you like about Calgary if you're a hockey player. You like about Winnipeg too. You know, a lot of people care about about hockey there. It's a really tight knit uh, community. But you're right. The the churn in the season ticket base there, the honeymoon being over, however you wanted to describe that, is is worrisome. And I think that the way you get it back is to is to you know put a competitive team on the ice. And so they're trying to do that fine dance that Calgary's doing and that fans don't seem to like at all, which is, you know, we have enough pieces here. Um, there are, you know, players coming. The, the league is really, really close. Um, if Vegas can do it, why can't we? Yep. So I've been meaning to, and I haven't done this yet, but do you remember the Flames went into Vegas and won big? Yep, 7-1. You know, right yeah, right yeah. Seven, one, seven, two. Yeah. I want to go back and re-watch that game. I want to see if that was just Vegas having a, a really off night or if there was something, some, something that the flames on that night captured that, you know, you know, magic in a bottle kind of a thing. And then, and then like, so what was it? You know, this is a team that won the Stanley cup championship, not that long afterwards. Nope. And, and yet on that way, they look night, bad. Yeah. They look bad. And the flames yeah. look great. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so are there lessons to be learned from from rewatching that game? I mean, you know that you know you you'll argue, you know, well that's a snapshot. You can't base it on one regular season game, but but something happened that night, and again, it, it could have just been all on the Vegas well, side. You it's know. hilarious that you say that because I was thinking I got to go back and watch that Nashville Calgary game at the end of the year because yeah. you were talking about Nashville going on a run. Yeah. Calgary needed that win, yeah. and Nashville ran the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they didn't have anything. Right? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that that's one of the reasons that we're seeing these these changes because Nashville ran that show without Philip Forsberg, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. And, and without exactly. Ryan Johansson. Exactly. You know? So they saw something in those yeah. young players that they liked that you know, they were winning, and and all of the high priced talent was was in the press box because they were on on IR. So yeah, yeah. It's, the the other one that I I'd love to go back, and I know what happened in the playoffs, but that uh, overtime loss to Boston where Calgary just completely, what were the shots like 56 oh, yeah. to 10 or something yeah. like that it was ridiculous. Sure. Even the, even the Bruins coach was, yeah. Right. How, how did we win? Uh, I, I feel, I feel bad for them because we didn't deserve this and they deserved it. That was fate. that. I felt so bad for flames fans because that was the season in a nutshell, right? Yeah. Like yeah. look at us. So we lost in overtime. Yeah. Uh, a couple more for you. Oh, speaking of which Arizona's apparently got six more possible sites for an arena. Does anybody take this stuff seriously anymore? Well, I think we're all at that point where, you know, I'll believe it when I see shovels in the ground, you know, or, or maybe when there's steel rising up out of the mm -hmm. ground. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think that 
you have to sometimes listen to what the commissioner and, and especially in this mm -hmm. case, the deputy commissioner is saying, which is we need a definitive answer by the middle of the year. We can't wait any longer. So that to me, okay. you know, Gary Bettman just in an, in, you get real information from Gary in, in the offhand asides that he sometimes gives, not when he's on message, <laughs> but, but, you know, you have to you really, I always joke. It's like uh, the old Kremlin watchers, right? You know, yeah. you listen to what they're saying and then you have to have somebody interpret that well that's what it is with with uh gary and, and i'm Bill. old enough to get that reference yeah, yeah. Hey, how long was the standing ovation yeah. ah he's safe yeah right exactly yeah so anyway so uh so i do think that um that they the messaging was pretty clear during you know the stanley cup finals and, and the various availabilities that we've had with uh the two men in charge of the national hockey league that while we value that market and want to preserve that market something we need an answer by the yeah. middle of the season and and so we'll see Last one for you, and I don't think it's necessarily a short answer or a short conversation. And you you came in when I was talking about it. Really big news in the world of hockey last night. Uh, now that we appear to be on the road to mm -hmm. one single female hockey league entity. Mm -hmm. You also were nodding your head when I mentioned the fact that I have talked to Gary Bettman, and he told me mm -hmm. that the NHL would engage when it was one single entity. Yeah. How big is this story? Well, uh, I think it's really big. Uh, you know, like th this is the equivalent, I guess, uh, in women's hockey of of the NHL and WHA coming together. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, I mean, I don't, I don't follow it as closely as Haley Salvian from our staff, but but it seems like this, you know, feud has been going on mm -hmm. for far too long, and it hasn't it hasn't benefited the benefited the sport. So you see what's happening in in, in other women's sports. So one of the I was down in the in this in Anaheim and they they had a um they had a conference uh of you know uh, women the, the evolution of, of women's professional sport and and one of the speakers uh made the point that you you need a couple of things you 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 need it needs to become mainstream so it needs to be available on television yep. all the time yep. it needs to have legitimate salaries it, it can't just be you know like it has been for a long time where everybody has a job and then they play hockey on the side it it needs to be a career and it probably will not start out as a highly paid career but but interest is is increasing and and the the number of people that are watching women's college softball uh, on, on ESPN. I mean, you know, they, they, they're getting... Volleyball's drawing they, incredible. They're, they're getting really good television numbers. Yeah, they are. You know, and, and so so that that moment is 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 here now where, where people are actually, you know, they're going through the clicker and, and a women's sport is on and they, they stay and, and they watch it. You know, I watch a lot of women's golf. Like, I, I think women's golf is really, really good. When I, when I see how far they could hit the ball and how well they chip and how many putts they make that I can't make. I, I'm just so respectful of, yep. of, of the game. And, and, and I, you know, it, it, it's more the game that I play than, than watching, you know, uh, you know, Brooks Kepka hit a 380 yard drive. I just kind of curse a lot when I, <laughs> when I see that, whereas the women's game, it's like, okay, that's, that, that's, 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 that's the game. That's the game that I play or well, it's, it isn't because they're way better, yeah, but, yeah. but it, but it's, it's, it's more achievable or, or, or manageable. So, so, but to, to but back to hockey, I, I think it is important. There will be casualties. Um, you know, they, they, I think that this is going to be one of those situations where they're, you know, starting from ground zero yeah. and they're building it up and, and, and we'll see where it goes, but, but it had to start somewhere. And to your point, you know, once it gets underway, you know, I think the NHL has been waiting for them to come with a, a united front and say, okay, here we are, you know, what, can you do to help us? And I think that, you know, in the same way that the NBA has, has, has supported, uh, mm -hmm. at least in the early stages, the WNBA, um, something like that has to, has to happen in, in women's, uh, hockey. And, and I, I've heard Gary say that, uh, on the record, off the record, you've heard him say yep. it. So we'll see. Um, I don't think they're going to come to the table tomorrow, but I think they want to see, you know, what the product looks like and, and to make sure that, you know, it's, it, it, it that this is that there isn't going to be like a breakaway faction in you know in, in three weeks time creating another rebel league and and, and turning the whole thing into a mm -hmm. chaotic mess again but uh yeah. but you're right it's an important first step and uh you know the people that have watched women's hockey at the olympics and then you know tuned out for for four years if, if they get um you know a, a more um 
available product uh, and they find that they like it, then, you know, then this is the start of something. Yeah. And again, I hope there's room for more than, you know, just a couple of teams. Like that's the other challenge is North America is such a big continent. Yeah. Travel can eat away budgets real quick. Right. Yeah. So where are you going to put your teams? And I think we're still waiting on that news too. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And what I would say is, is start small and then work your way up. Like, if, Oh, if, for sure. Yeah. If you, yeah. if you, even if you just start with six teams, here's 32 teams. Well, that ain't going to work. No, 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 no. But if, but if you start with six or eight yeah. and, and especially, you know, like if you concentrate them, like if you don't put one in Calgary right away, but you put them in, you know, Toronto and Montreal and Boston and Buffalo and, and New York and New Jersey and, and have them in an, in an area where, you know, the travel is, is not Reasonable. as, as yeah. onerous as it is, say if you're you know trying to make a trip across the country um, yep. then then i think you have a chance yeah um before i let you go uh thanks jack uh jonathan it's a signing before the free agency begins right jack yeah so it's not confirmed but quick is expected to join the rangers jonathan quick to the rangers to the rangers okay yeah. so he basically replaces yaroslav halak yeah so yeah all right yeah okay I tomorrow is going to be interesting, but it's not going to be like it was a decade ago, right? Where you know, how can they sign a guy at twelve oh one? It didn't start till twelve, yeah. you know, and and then you know the remember the old uh, we just saw somebody go into the building. Who was it that the oh it was Richards? Brad Richards, Brad yeah. Richards yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Because didn't and the flames the flames showed up and all these teams, uh, you know, making their pitches to, That's to right. Brad Richards and Donnie me. And then there was a little bit of that with John Tavares too. So, yeah, so, yeah, you're, you're right. That, that is not going to be happening. And, I, I'm uh, afraid that we're getting to 12 months a year. I'm afraid that there's going to be fairly significant potential deals to be made in August. You could, right. Cause it used to be, it all wrap up by the 5th of July and away we go. We'll see in September. Well, how about those of us that, you know, like I, I'm trying to think the number of days I actually, I, I was we were talking to my boss about this, you know, you, you worked every weekend for the last eight, eight weeks, you know, so you're looking for a day off here mm. and there and it's like, okay, take this day. Wait, but, but something happened and now you can't. So, yeah. so yes, we are, those of us who grind away at this for a long period of time are waiting for that moment where we can, where, where we can take a break. And I, I do think that, uh, well, I mean, I think August will will be quiet this year from what I can get. I, I think it's partly because because everybody I know in the industry, the managers, the the coaches, the public relations staff, they're all burned out. Mm -hmm. You know, this was the year that it was supposed to get back on track. It sort of has. Yeah. But normally there's there's a bit more of a gap between the uh, the, the draft and free agency. I mean, you know, yeah, there, there's true. an awful lot. I got out, but but not everybody is home yet. You know. Oh no, we got a we got a show that's still on the road at some point. Jack, do we know where they are yet? Yeah. I think they're home. Okay. They're home now. Yeah. yeah. They were in a car at one point. I, and then having pancakes at 439. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. That's our guys. That that really looked grim. But I, I can tell you horror stories of the people that um that I travel with. You know, our our Shana Goldman never made it two two basically camped out at Newark Airport for two days. Sean McIndoe just got there in time and he's you know, he's still stuck there. I mean, it, oh. it's 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 crazy, you know. And uh I don't know if did, did you see the story that uh, that Saad Youssef did? Uh Saad is our Dallas Star reporter, yep. and it's of interest because it involves Yuri Fadina. Yeah. Um, you know they uh, they they couldn't get a flight, so they drove. They they were in a car crash. Uh, luckily, you know, fine. And then a good Samaritan basically drove them to Nashville. I in mean, an RV. It, it's, a, right? in a, it's an incredible story. I know. Uh, and someone who didn't know who they were or doesn't really know, know. Much about hockey. Yeah. Just you're kind of a good Samaritan. It's uh, yeah, it's 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 crazy. So, uh, but yeah, I, I hope for uh you know so but every again all the managers i talked to you know kenny holland i said well, you know what are you doing on july the first well nothing because you know on july 1st all the agents are going to want term and dollars we don't mm -hmm. have term and dollars so i'll be poking around on the second the third and the fourth because at that point you know whatever's left uh you know it might be prepared to take less money and, and less term and who knows uh you know uh, my thing is that last year there was one John Klinberg situation, right? One guy that just completely missed the boat, just misread the market, mm -hmm. missed, missed time the market. And then, and then found he was you know left out in the cold. I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there were five or more like that, you know, players who've been waiting a long time, 
you know, it, it's like selling your house in, in a down market. I'm not selling my house for under this, you know, mm -hmm. because I've been, I paid X for it, you know, and then all of a sudden all the houses on your street sell and yours doesn't because, you know, you, you're dug in. And that, that I think is going to happen in free agency. Some players are going to get dug in. Some agents are going to get dug in. They're going to, you know, maybe not necessarily communicate properly and, and somebody's going to be left there. You know, and I, there's no absolutely. money left in the system or the, team, the teams that have money left want to preserve the money. And that now what do you do? So we'll see that, that that's a month from now. But uh, but if you want to talk about it a month from now, we'll you know, we can do a roll call. Well, we'll do it. Ne we'll do next week. All and right. then, then we're going to give you a break. OK, you deserve that. I, I do. Um, All right, good. <laughs> before we go, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, Bob McCowan took to social media today. I know you've done his show a lot. Um, he means a lot to me in the industry because he's, he's been, you know, the biggest voice in sports radio, but anyway, Bob has suffered a pair of strokes over the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. and has been in hospital. He can't walk or talk right now, but yeah. he's getting better. So we want to wish him all the best. Um, that one's hard. I know you do the show still. Yeah. And, and so if you remember the last one I did was, uh, uh, with just John Shannon and, and, and uh, uh, and, we were told at that time that this had happened to Bob, but to keep it under our hats. And so, uh, so yeah, uh, you know, uh, I, it sounded like he was going to make it. He was having issues with his speech, which is, you know, pr as a host, yep, you probably understand how challenging that absolutely. Can be. So, um, so hopefully that will come back and, and come around. And uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm like you, like you know, we fight Bob and I sometimes mm -hmm. on on the air, but but in a you know oh yeah in a, no. in a in a good spirited way and and i like to fence with him and i hope to be able to do that again yeah i hope to hear it yeah um <laughs> thank you for this good to see you and like you say we'll check in next week and and who knows maybe there'll be nine john klingbergs yeah well if there's nine you know five of them will be signed the week after ah, but i'm enough. waiting for a month from now to okay see who's uh, who really gets shortchanged that, that that will be interesting so perfect thank you sir all right my pleasure <laughs> Eric Dahachik, everybody from The Athletic. You can read him there, of course, brought to you by Ski Seller Snowboard. SkiSellersnowboard.com, 76 years in Calgary. Now, all the locations are closed here for the next little while, including the McLeod Trail, which was the last one. But they will reopen again in the fall, and they will be ready to roll for all of your winter needs. Not just the equipment, not just the bindings, not just the poles, but also the clothing that goes along with it. Um, they've got the snow skating, which you've got to check out if you're a hockey player. you got to try check out snow skating. Uh, just a brilliant, brilliant place to go. But the website, always open, always available. SkiSellerSnowboard.com. SkiSellerSnowboard.com. Uh, just a plug for my pal, Danny Austin and live from 55, the podcast, which drops twice a week on the CFL. The stamps are off this week, uh, but that doesn't mean the Danny is he dropped the new, uh, live from 55. So you want to make sure you check that out Monday, no show because of the long weekend. Uh, barn burner, I believe is back on Tuesday. We're back Wednesday, Friday next week. Uh, you already heard Eric DeHatchek will join us on Friday. Peter Marr with his final visit of the year is going to join us on Wednesday. And we probably will have a chock full of other guests at some point. I uh, do want to make note of uh, the fact that uh, tomorrow, uh, when free agency goes, the uh, Nation Network and the Daily Faceoff have you covered. Uh, Frank Saravelli and I believe Tyler Yaramchuk have a show uh, that will be live just before everything goes down. So make sure you check that out. And Ryan Pike uh, and his crew continue to pump out the stories at flamesnation.com. So if you're a Calgary Flames fan, you certainly want to check that out. Heading into the long weekend, um, a couple things that we want to do here in the final mile. I'm really excited for our pal Brett Sutter, the captain of the Calgary Wranglers this year. Uh, Brett has been named the uh, Professional Hockey Players Association Veteran Presence Award winner for the West Conference of the American Hockey League. Um, the son of Daryl, the brother of Chris, son of Wanda as well. Um, just an outstanding young man. Um, I go back to our story um, that he played his 1,000th American Hockey League game and he was given a $10,000 donation uh, on, by the uh, uh, Flames Foundation, Wranglers Foundation, and he uh, directed it to superheroes to allow our kids to go to Ottawa to play in a, a special hockey tournament. So uh, Brett forever has a, a, a place in our hearts and uh, just really like it when good things happen to good people. Good people, you say. Good people, you say. Um, news today. 
uh, Peter Labardius, uh, formerly of Sportsnet, formerly of Rogers, formerly of Sportsnet 960, the fan, Pete, uh, taking to uh, social media to announce that he has launched his own uh, entity, uh, Labardius Media. For the last 10 years, he was a color analyst on Flames radio broadcasts. He replaced Mike Rogers, worked uh, briefly with Peter Marr, but mostly with Derek Wills. Uh, prior to that, he was television voice on Sportsnet. Um, he has been the voice of the World Juniors. He's been the voice of the CHL. Um, he covered the Oilers and did some Montreal Canadiens games. He, um, I, I just don't even know where to begin. This is not a, a goodbye, and this is not a, um, you know, I, I'm not rushing to the defense, nor do I have to rush to the defense of Peter Labardius. He made this decision. He is walking away on his terms. Uh, for those who pay close attention to Pete, um, he's busy, very busy, uh, calling games. Uh, he is the epitome of of a play-by-play -play announcer. Um, and it's not my intention to, to cause a strain or grief or take a run at anybody. That's not my intention. Uh, he did very good as a color guy, but I'm, I, my favorite Peter Labardius is Peter Labardius in the play-by-play -play chair. Cause I think he's, um, he's got emotion. He's got energy. He's got a whole lot of things that quite frankly, the business, just moved away from uh, there's a little bit more cookie cutter to it there's a little bit more um for lack of a better term commer uh kind of a commercial feel to it rather than an organic feel and uh you know pete the next person i meet that doesn't like peter labardius will be the first person i meet um that's just how it is um i first met pete back in um, um i guess it would have been april may of uh 2000 or of uh, 1999 uh then the voice of the estevan bruins we were in the uh royal bank cup in yorkton peter had been the voice of the estevan bruins prior to me um but he had moved on to television and was uh this i believe the six o'clock sports anchor on uh, cfrn uh, news and CTV up in Edmonton, but he took his holidays as he always did to, to check out uh, different sporting events. And he traveled to Yorkton to see the, uh, the Royal bank cup. And um, you know, I was there um, doing the Bruins games on the radio on CJ 1280 in, in Esteban. And that's where Pete used to do it. And uh, he came up to me and introduced himself. I knew who he was, but he came up to me and introduced himself and he was kind enough um to stick around and do a little color with me on a, an afternoon game. And it, it never happened before. It's never happened since, but in the middle of the game, in the, in the first intermission, I lost my voice and Pete without missing a beat did play by play in that game. And, uh, I was able to come back and, and finish the rest of the tournament. Um, uh, but I had barely known the man for 40 minutes and I was begging him to, to do what he loves to do and what he's so good at. And I, I remember the reaction to that and I'll, I'll never forget Pete's reaction to that. Um, that has spawned a 24 year friendship, um, that's had its ups, that's had its downs. Um, it's tough. It's tough. Um, you know, Pete was a really good friend of mine and, Sportsnet moved on and they hired me to replace him. And, uh, that was hard. And he, he, he was a pro. He was a professional. He was, uh, just a true gentleman. I'm not hundred percent sure that I could have been the same. No, I, as a matter of fact, I know I'm not the same in the same boat. He he's just, um, incredible. But the, the thing about Peter Labardi is he's not going anywhere. Like it's not a farewell. Um, it's an next chapter. But since we're talking about him and I got the opportunity, I do want to say this. You know, we talked today with Eric about the young hockey players have the same passion about the game. We talked about this when Mike Morielli was on. We talked about, you know, the study that came out, Rick Westhead and a lot of actual news picked it up about how passionate kids are about sport. The scary thing is they're not as passionate as we were, my age group. And I'm sure we, in fairness, we probably weren't as passionate as our fathers and our mothers. Um, but nobody I have ever met has a passion for sport like Peter Labardius. We say that all the time. We say, oh, that guy. 
Nobody but that guy, that guy, that guy, that guy. Labardius would pay money to watch two people put on skates and play a full ice shinny game against each other for the first time ever. He would pay money to see that. He would uh, he will travel to the ends of the earth to watch women's softball. He will travel to the ends of the earth to watch young prospects in hockey. He will travel to the ends of the earth of wherever a Canadian flag is flown in an Olympic or uh, international competition. He, nobody has the passion for sport. If I could bottle it, if I could sell it, if I could clone him, I absolutely would. I thought I loved game, the sports, the sports. You know, now I'm sounding like my dad. I thought I loved hockey. I thought I loved sports. It was, it was a rude awakening right, right to the marrow in his bones. Peter Labardius loves competition, loves the Canadian flag, loves to call it. I hope the next chapter is almost a rebirth for him. I hope he's happy. Um, nobody cares as much as Pete does. And I can tell you that. Nobody. So, Pete, thank you for the last 24 years, my friend. Thank you for the last 10 years as a color, color man on uh, 960's hockey broadcast, the Flames Radio flagship station. Uh, my hope is they keep that broadcast going. Um, I know the world is changing. But Peter Labardius is a good man, or if you like, number sign, good people. That's it for us. Uh, have a great long weekend. Uh, remember, we broadcast this show live uh, from Treaty 7 Territory. We are an inclusive podcast. Everybody, and I mean everybody, is welcome here. Uh, as, as long as you want to have a little smirk, as long as you want to have a little fun, as long as you want to get eh, tweaked a little bit. Uh, that's all that I care about. So I'm glad that yeah, you could spend some time with us. Uh, we will be back on Wednesday. Peter Mahar, Bonesaw, will be with us. Uh, for Jack, our outstanding producer, I'm Rob. Don't forget, Nation Network, Daily Faceoff, have you covered for uh, Free Agency Frenzy beginning tomorrow. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you soon.